since I'm talking about mobility, I figure I should be mobile up here. You know, keep things moving. Um, so let's start off with a very informal um, survey, shall we? Um, the, the confidence interval on this is going to be really low. So don't blame me if it's not statistically valid and so forth and so on. But how many of you walked here today? Keep your hands up. How many of you biked here today? All right. How many of you took transit? Keep your hands up. How many of you took transit here today? All right. Now, hands down. How many of you drove here today? OK. So what we're going to talk about in a minute is in our carbon neutral future, half the room should have raised their hand to the first three. Now, of those of you who drove, put your hands back up. It's, this isn't public shaming. I drove myself. How many of you drove an electric vehicle? OK. So the rest of the room, 10 years from now, 2030, all those hands would be electric in theory, right? This is how we're going to achieve carbon neutrality in the mobility sector. Uh, and for those of you, you know, who followed this discussion through now, mobility and transportation account for about 17% of our total greenhouse gases. So it's not an insignificant amount. We have a lot to do in this space. So you've seen the big picture, right? We've seen all these strategies. We're going to be focusing on the second and third, right? So like I just said, the first strategy is really how do we reduce how many miles we travel in a vehicle? I may use the term vehicle miles traveled or VMT, forgive me. Um, it just pretty much means how much people are driving. Then the second part is for those who are still driving, how can we shift that over to electric vehicles? And that's both in terms of personal vehicles, that's talking about transit vehicles, that's talking about fleets, delivery, so forth and so on. So let's unpack each one of these one by one. <clears throat> So the first is 50% reduction in vehicle miles traveled, how much we drive. What are the things that we can do to get us there? And we'll, go into a lot of, we'll go into these in more detail, but I'll just kind of show, give you a sneak peek at them right now. So the first is, how can we improve our transit? Uh, for a community of our size, our transit is actually pretty good. But for those of you who take transit, like myself, I use it on a regular basis, you know you have some planning to do around our transit system. You know, some, especially on weekends, for those of you who took transit today, I'm sure you appreciate the fact that the bus may only be running about once an hour on the weekend. Um, during weekday, that same route might run every 30 minutes, every 20 minutes, but that's not necessarily convenient. So what are the things that we can do to really make transit an attractive option for transportation? And that has a couple functions, right? It's frequency, it's coverage, how often does the bus come, how reliable is it? How, how, what is its on-time performance? What are the things that really get people onto a bus so they don't have to worry about whether the bus is coming or not? Or if the bus pulls away and you see it pull away, oh, there goes my bus, and you try to chase after it. You don't have to do that because you know another one is coming in maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So ultimately, one of the things that we've talked about internally with the Technical Advisory Committee and others is, you know, how can we get coverage so that 95% of the population has, within a 10-minute walk, access to a bus that runs 20 minutes or more frequently than that. Because, you know, once we start getting under the 20-minute realm, you know, for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, what we call headways, then really, you don't have to plan your whole day around the, the bus trip. You know that a bus is coming, whether, it's, whether you made it to the, the bus stop in time or if you didn't. So it's a really important dynamic. If you've ever been to kind of a big city, um, if you've been you know, to a city that has a subway system, you don't really check the subway schedule. There may not even be a subway schedule published, right? Because it comes every two minutes, every three minutes, every five minutes. So how can we get transit to a level of operation that really can support it as one of the more desirable, attractive forms of transportation in our community? The other thing, too, is, and I think you've heard some of this mentioned before, uh, the city is updating its transportation plan. So if you haven't clued into that process, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we've had several engagement opportunities throughout the way. Um, one of the, the statistics that we recently developed as part of our mobility fact book is, and, and I think you've probably heard this before, there's a large percentage of the community that commutes into town on a daily basis. So 80,000 people or more commute into town every day. So we can do as much as we can within our city borders, but there's still an influence from beyond our city borders of people coming to town. 
So what are the ways that we can kind of increase um, a shift from those trips onto other forms of transportation? You know, people who are coming from Brighton aren't going to walk, right? They're not going to bike. But are there transit solutions that can be thought of? Are there carpool solutions, van pool solutions? Um, are there high capacity transit solutions? So when I talk about high capacity transit, I'm talking about next generation transit. I'm not talking about just a 40 foot bus. It could still be a bus. It could be a bus in a dedicated busway. The reason why a dedicated busway is important is because it then becomes competitive with vehicles on the roadway. Right? If a bus has its own lane when it's traveling, all of a sudden it can keep on time and it's running as fast as driving in a vehicle. Um, so, and then, you know, at the far end of the spectrum, you're talking about commuter rail, regional rail, light rail, solutions like that. Accompanied with this is the idea of park and ride systems. I'm sure many of you have seen these around town. We have them on Plymouth. Uh, we have them, you know, there are even some within the MDOT network, uh, north on 23. Uh, and the idea is to intercept people who are coming into town, either on the periphery of town or somewhere outside, so that they can kind of congregate and get into more efficient forms of transportation before they come into the city central or to the university. So you can do this through, again, van pools. You can do this through transit options. You can do this through high capacity transit. But what is our capacity to expand the transit system to really make it attractive, right? I mean, people don't love to be stuck in traffic. I don't, maybe someone in the audience does, but it's not really a desirable uh, experience. Um, and we're seeing, you know, future generations are also kind of bucking the trend of rushing out and getting their driver's license at the age of 16 if they have viable options, uh, other transportation options to get around town. Because people would rather spend time, you know, doing work, reading, engaging on social media than necessarily behind the wheel. And so providing opportunities for people to get out of their vehicle and onto other forms of transportation is an important consideration. The other thing too is how can we increase the amount of walking and biking, especially within town? You know, the city of Ann Arbor footprint is not very big. You know, the, the distance that is fairly comfortable to bike, you know, depending upon who you ask, but roughly is, and maybe Larry has an opinion on this, but you know, in the industry sometimes we say seven miles or less is, is a pretty comfortable bike ride. You know, you can do that in probably 20 minutes or so. That's not too bad. Um, and if you think about Ann Arbor, you can get in a lot of places within seven miles from where you are. Especially if you're headed into downtown or if you're headed to the campus, you know, if you draw a seven mile perimeter around those areas, that pretty much covers the most of, of the city. But what would it take to shift people into those forms of transportation? Right? We need to have higher quality bicycle facilities. People need to feel safe. People have to feel comfortable riding on a bike lane. A lot of people do not feel comfortable what we call in mixed flow traffic or share the road conditions, right? Where, you know, you're just in a, in a travel lane with a vehicle and you have to share that space. That's not a very comfortable environment. But then if you see what was recently done by the uh, Downtown Development Authority on William Street, where you have a protected, buffered bike lane, that's a much higher comfort facility. I'm a pretty confident cyclist. I am able to bike in mixed flow traffic, but I will not do that with my eight-year-old daughter. I would do it on the William Street bike lane, or what we call a cycle track. So, you know, there's kind of this spectrum of cyclists out there. Now, now I acknowledge not everybody can ride a bicycle, but how can we give opportunities to people for those who want to, to be able to get out there and ride a bicycle, or for that matter, walk? You know, we have miles of disconnected sidewalk within the city. Uh, there are miles of gaps, as we call it. What are some of the strategies that we can do to make sure that for people who want to walk, can walk, and have a safe and comfortable environment to do so? The other thing is, and Missy alluded to this just a second ago, we're going to sneak in some land use things on here. And you might say, wait a second, Raymond. This is a transportation discussion. Don't try to sneak in some land use and zoning stuff on me. But these two are in, inextri inextricably, does that make sense? Yeah, Inextri inextricably intertwined, right? Uh, and the reason why is because where you live, where you work, where you play, where you go to school, is directly related to the transportation of how you get to and from those places and the proximity of those places to one another. 
So the idea here is what are some of the solutions we can do to minimize the even need to take a trip? So first and foremost, this idea of Let's look at density, right? So if we allow for more um, housing units within the city proper, then that in theory reduces the amount of trips that are coming from outside the city. So can we allow duplexes, triplexes, and quad quadplexes by right? You know, so there is no more single family residential zoning. There's kind of these varying levels of multifamily uh, residential zoning everywhere. So it allows people to densify even on their own properties. The other thing to note here is how can we provide mixed use opportunities within our neighborhoods and throughout town? Do we always have to go to downtown if we want to get a beer or an ice cream? The ice cream is the important part, right? How close is your nearest ice cream parlor? Mine is Washington Dairy. For you, just in case you were wondering, you weren't, but I know it and I map it out. Uh, it's a mile uh, from my house, but that's still a little far, right? If I'm going to bike there with my daughter, you know, she's still, especially the, that hill on 5th, if you've ever tried to bike that, it's a monster. Um, you know, her little legs are going to have a hard time uh, keeping up. So how can I get to one closer to our neighborhood? So what are the opportunities for us to provide um, mixed-use neighborhoods so that we can reduce the trips altogether so that you don't have to get into a vehicle to go a far distance to get what you need. Can we have more neighborhood shops, more neighborhood restaurants, neighborhood breweries, ice cream shops, whatever the case may be. So those are the strategies related to reducing the amount of vehicle miles we travel. Next, I'm gonna shift over to the electrification piece. And so there's several pieces that we wanna explore related to this. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna jump back. There's one other strategy, especially related to land use, that I think bears mention. It's not specifically related to mixed use neighborhoods, but another thing that we do that really encourages driving is our parking strategies and our parking policies. Right, so if, if any of you are familiar, there was a, a professor out of Berkeley, his name was Donald Shoup. He wrote a book called The High Cost of Free Parking. And ultimately, the, the, the premise is when we provide free parking, we're providing a subsidy and an encouragement for people to drive. Okay, and so now some people may say, well, wait a second, Raymond. You know, the, and I always talk about myself in the third person, so uh, no. Uh, wait a second, Raymond. You know, parking is not cheap downtown. And parking is not cheap on campus. Well, I, I might argue some of that is true and some of it maybe isn't true. There are some very cheap parking spaces in the immediate vicinity of downtown. You know, if you park in a parking structure, it's uh, I think between $1.20 and $1.60 an hour. Uh, if you park there for a full day, it comes out to about $12. But if you buy an annual pass, it's $700. So once you've bought that annual pass, you've already spent that money, you are now encouraged to use it, right? There isn't a lot of disincentive to not drive once you've already bought that pass. Um, the other thing to note is, you know, um, there's a whole range of different pricing structures at the university. Uh, my understanding, and some of you in the room may know this better than me, but a gold pass is somewhere north of $1,000 or $2,000. But a student pass, or a hunting permit, right, is, is like in the realm of under $100, right? And so there's this huge breadth of what we actually charge for pricing, and it's not very dynamic, right? We don't really adjust prices based on demand. We don't ad adjust prices based on supply. It's just a flat rate depending upon what kind of parking we have and where. And so you can really influence behavior with parking, and this is one of the things that came out of Donald Shoup's book, The High Cost of Free Parking. You can really see how you can kind of influence people's driving behaviors based on parking. All right, now I'll go to the uh, electrification piece. So under the electrification piece, there are kind of two big strategies. The first is really how do we encourage um, and expand the charging network, and then how do we electrify, especially the commercial vehicles that are in the community. So uh, the first is expanding the EV charging infrastructure. Uh, so the idea here is what are the opportunities, especially in the public spaces, um, in public parking around the city, that we can put the infrastructure in that acts as an encouragement for people when they come to park, they have the infrastructure there to charge their vehicle. 
Now we do have some of this already, right? I mean, some of the parking garages, I know the, the probably the, the biggest charging infrastructure is at the uh, library garage. Um, I think the Ann and Ashley garage has some as well. Um, but for any of you who drive an electric vehicle, uh, you'll notice that by about nine o'clock, all those spaces are taken. The other thing to note, going back to my previous point about kind of dynamic pricing, you also note people don't move once they get one of those posh spaces, right? So you might see those cars fully charged, but they don't move once they're fully charged because there's no incentive to, right? I got this, the best spot in the house, I'm plugged in, you know, my, I'm fully charged after four hours, I drive a Volt, so I'm fully charged after four hours, but, you know, there's no incentive for me to move my car after four hours. It may be there for eight hours, 10 hours, or 11 hours the whole day. So what are the ways that we can rethink through both the parking structure as well, or the parking payment, as well as the encouragement of how we match the resources against what that demand is? The other thing too here is, you know, the ride has been a part of the Mobility Technical Advisory Committee and there have been discussions with the university as well. What are the opportunities for us to electrify the buses in the community? Right, so we talked earlier about shifting people out of vehicles onto transit, onto bikes, onto uh, their feet, but if the transit vehicles aren't electric, then we haven't really accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. So this opportunity here is really speaking to that. What are the, how can we get the buses to be electric, both for the ride as well as the university, and make sure that we kind of ramp up their fleet so that uh, it really reflects kind of this community desire to have electric vehicles throughout uh, driving on our streets. Oh.